welcome back. We're still doing the World of Warcraft Chronicles Volume 1, and we're on to the Troll Wars, Part 1. The Siege of Kael'thalas, 2,800 years before the Dark Portal. Millennia after being defeated by the High Elves, the Amani Trolls plotted revenge within their temple city of Zolaman. Yet though they were fierce warriors, the Trolls lacked a strong leader who could bring them victory infighting had also spread throughout the tribe, threatening to destroy it from within. The Imani's fortunes soon changed when they received aid from the revered Zandalar tribe. <clears throat> the Zandalari saw themselves as the protectors and spiritual leaders of all trolls. They were eager to strengthen troll societies across Azeroth many of which had languished since the time of the Great Sundering. Even the Zandalari had suffered from that catastrophic event. Their once glorious mountain home of Zandalar had been swallowed by the sea, leaving nothing more than a small island behind. In the Amani, the Zandalari saw an opportunity to revitalize one of the race's most powerful tribes and reassert troll dominance in the, early Eastern, sorry, in the Eastern Kingdoms. Overwhelming the High Elves would be no easy task, but the Zandalari were confident of victory. Kel'Thalas was not as powerful as the ancient Night Elf Empire that had decimated the trolls so long ago. In addition, the Zandalari had honed and perfected their own voodoo arts over recent millennia. A handful of wise Zandalari emissaries made the journey from their island home to Zolomon. There they promised to help the Amani plan for their impending conflict. More importantly, the Zandalari would ensure that the mighty Loa demigods would aid the trolls in battle. To settle matters of leadership, the Zandalari also made one of the Amani's most fearless warriors, Jintha, the ruler of his people. Small Amani warbands began emerging from the forests and attacking Kel'Thalas borders, testing the High Elves' strength. Always the cunning trolls hid their true numbers and capabilities. After a series of successful skirmishes, the Amani decided that the time for all-out war had finally come. Without warning, tens of thousands of troll fighters exploded from the shadowy forests. Monstrous Loa demigods marched alongside the Amani, infusing their troll adherents with supernatural might. The High Elves struggled desperately to hold back their foes, but they were forced to give ground. With astonishing speed and ferocity, the Amani, <clears throat> the Amani laid waste to the outer reaches of Kel'Thalas. From Zolomon, the Zandalari emissaries observed the unfolding war with pleasure. Even the elves and their potent arcane powers could not withstand the might of the Amani, the might of the troll race. The trolls' ultimate victory was only a matter of time. So this is a map of what um, it looked like back in the day of, well, there's Alterac, Erethor, Strom, the Amani Empire, right in between the elves and the humans. <clears throat> the Troll Wars Part 2, Fire from the Heavens. King Thoradin kept a careful watch over the intensifying war between the High Elves and the Trolls. Scouts returned to Strom with tales of smoke rising along Kel'Thalas' borders, of brutalized elven corpses littering the once tranquil grottos of the Northlands. Clearly the Trolls were winning, but Thoradin clung to his stubborn belief that intervening in the conflict would put his people at unnecessary risk. However, Thoradin's opinion changed when a group of High Elven ambassadors sent by King Anastirian Sunstrider suddenly arrived at Strom. With growing horror, Thoradin listened as the messengers related first-hand accounts of the Amani's stark brutality and the otherworldly demigods who fought by their side. The Amani threat was far greater than Thoradin or his advisors could have ever imagined. The High Elves argued that without assistance from Erethor, the trolls would soon destroy Kel'Thalas. After that, the Imani would launch the full might of their blood-crazed warbands against Strom itself. 
Following the meeting, Thoradin consulted with his advisors. They agreed that allying with the elves was prudent, but they also knew that Erethor did not have the forces required to fight an open conflict with the trolls. Thoradin and his advisors debated well into the night before coming to a conclusion. If the humans were taught magic, it might give them the edge they needed to truly make an impact in the war. Elven magic was legendary among humans, but they had never learned its secrets. Although Thoradin harbored a deep suspicion of sorcery in all its forms, he knew that his forces would require it in order to vanquish the Amani. The next day, Thoradin returned to the ambassadors with an offer. In exchange for military aid, the High Elves would teach humans magic. The High Elves dispatched messengers to consult with King Anastirian. Like all of his kind, he knew well the dangers of unchecked magic. Teaching the arcane arts to humans could easily lead to disaster. Yet as much as this possibility troubled Anastirian, his own people were facing extinction. Knowing he had little choice, he agreed that the High Elves would tutor 100 humans in the rudimentary ways of magic. Before long, elven magi journeyed to Strom and hastily began their mentorship of humans. Over the course of many months, the tutors observed something remarkable in their students. Although the humans lacked grace and subtlety in their castings, they possessed a startling natural affinity to magic. Meanwhile, Thoradin ordered his generals to establish a stronghold at the base of the Alterac Mountains. This would act as a staging point for their future offensive against the trolls. Thoradin's generals also erected other crude forts in the East Weald, a large stretch of fertile foothills east of Tiresfall Glades. However, Alterac Fortress would remain the humans' most important northern holding. Once the elves had finished tutoring the human magi, Erethor began its offensive. Over 20,000 human soldiers gathered at Alterac Fort Fortress. From there, Thoradin himself led his forces towards Kelthalas. He did not, however, bring the human magi with him they would remain behind the walls of Alterac. If things progressed, as Thoradin hoped, the Magi would play a part later in the war. Generals Igneous and Lordain acted as the vanguard of Erethor's armies. Riding days ahead of the advancing Erathi host, they cleared the way north and slaughtered any troll scouts and raiding parties they could find. After weeks of hard marching, the full might of Erethor's armies finally reached the outskirts of Kelthalas and smashed into the southern flank of the Amani. In coordination with the Arathi, the High Elves launched a counterattack from the north and laid waste to the trolls' front lines. The Amani now found themselves fighting a war on two fronts. Yet Jintha remained confident the trolls would emerge victorious. The Elves' decision to ally with the primitive humans reeked of desperation. The Arathi had a reputation as fierce warriors, but they lacked the magic powers and battle discipline of the Elves. The crude humans were a minor nuisance, one that Jintha would quickly eradicate. Intent on destroying Arathor's armies, he turned his warbands south to crush the humans. Once he had slaughtered them, Jintha would refocus his forces on Kelthalas and exterminate the elves for good. On Thoradin's orders, the humans began a slow retreat back toward Alterac. Weeks of brutal and bloody fighting followed as the overconfident Amani chased Erethor's armies to the mountains. As the humans moved south, the High Elves emerged from Kelthalas and marched for Alterac as well. They constantly harried the northern flank of the Amani, slowly whittling down the trolls' rearguard. Upon finally reaching Alterac Fortress, Thoradin was pleased to find that the Amani were still in pursuit. He readied his forces for the attack that he knew was soon to come. One morning, as a thick fog enveloped the Alterac foothills, the Amani fell upon the human army. Although outnumbered, the Arathi fought back with unexpected tenacity. The battle raged on for days, with neither side giving ground. Before long, the High Elves arrived from the north and assailed the Amani on a second front. When the humans and elves were confident they had worn down the Amani ranks, they unleashed their secret weapon, the 100 Human Magi. Throughout the recent days of fighting, Thoradin had kept them hidden within Alterac for Fortress. Now it was time to test their mettle in battle. Alongside the elven sorcerers, the human magi called upon their vast, newfound powers. 
Instead of attacking individually, the Magi did something unprecedented. They pooled their power and wove a single, terrible spell. The Alterac Mountains heaved and trembled as torrents of fire lashed down from the blood-red sky. The energies engulfed the Amani ranks in a searing conflagration. These sorcerous flames burned Loa and Troll alike from the inside out. Among the first of the Amani to be consumed in the enchanted flames was Jintha. Without their leader, the surviving trolls broke ranks and retreated north. The elves and humans hunted them down like game, slaughtering every Amani combatant they could find. The disastrous battle floored the Zandalari emissaries. Once so confident of victory, they skulked back to their island home in disbelief and shame. For them, the defeat marked a dark turning point in troll history, one from which their beleaguered race might never recover. Yet for Kel'Thalas and Erethor, the war was the beginning of a glorious new era. For months after the cessation of the conflict, celebrations graced the streets of Strom and Silvermoon City. The Grateful Elves pledged their undying loyalty to Erethor and to Thoradin's descendants. During the retreat to Alterac, the Amani began gaining on the humans too fast, threatening to flank and overwhelm Erethor's armies. To avert disaster, General Lordane volunteered to waylay the trolls, knowing full well he would not survive. He and 500 of his bravest warriors held off the Amani host in a narrow valley, while the rest of the Arathi army <clears throat> continued retreating south. Lordane and his warriors paid the ultimate price, but their valiant stand helped secure victory for humans and elves alike. Lordane's legacy of pure selflessness and sacrifice would live on among his people in the coming millennia. Lordane. Sounds a little bit like Lordaeron. I'll have to find out if that has anything to do with it. The Expansion of Erethor. 2,700 years before the Dark Portal. After King Thoradin's reign had ended, new generations of humans expanded the nation of Erethor in size and power. Many of the first human magi tutored pupils in the ways of the arcane. Within a few decades, the number of spellcasters within Erethor had increased dramatically. Protected from natural threats by these powerful magi, enterprising humans founded new Arathi settlements in the frontier lands. Some claimed the verdant pastures of the Eastweald, territories once lorded over by the trolls. Others migrated to Alterac Fortress, as well as to the smaller forts that had been built during the Troll Wars. These fortified holdings soon flourished into bustling trading outposts. The most coveted and fertile lands were located in Tirisval Glades. There, the Arathi established a stronghold to protect their farmsteads from gnolls, kobolds, and other dangerous wildlife. Many former soldiers settled in this region, which they renamed Lordaeron, in honor of the late General Lordane. <laughs> I was right! <laughs> Other Arathi expanded to the coastal region known as Gilneas, where they constructed a series of robust harbors. The settlers fished the waters and engaged in rigorous trade with other parts of Erethor. The boldest of these soldiers ventured into the open waters around Gilneas. In time, they discovered a large island to the south that was rich with metal ores and other valuable natural resources. Some of the sailors stayed on this island and founded a mighty maritime outpost named Kul Tiras. Over the decades, these new cities continued to grow and develop their own unique customs. The ruling powers in Erethor's capital, Strom, were ever wary that these settlements uh, would become too independent. Despite these rulers' attempts to retain control over the kingdom, many cities did eventually gain more autonomy. The first and most notable example of this was the trading outpost of Dalaran. Established in the heart of Erethor, Dalaran quickly became a trading center of great import and influence. Citizens from across Erethor flocked to the city in a quest for wealth and new opportunity. One of these immigrants was a brilliant and eccentric mage named 
Ardagon. He won the admir admiration of Dalaran's populace and was elected as its ruler. Under Ardogon's governance, Dalaran would continue expanding in power and would ultimately evolve into an autonomous city-state. It would also become a much-needed haven for Arathor's Magi, a population that the kingdom's citizenry increasingly viewed with suspicion and wariness. The Council of Tirasfall the growth and prosperity experienced by Arathor was due in large part to Magi and the protection they offered settlers. Even so, private distrust of sorcerers festered among the general populace. Over time, dissent and superstition grew, igniting tensions between magic users and the rest of society. Most Magi withdrew from cities and towns, angry at being subjected to what they saw as baseless paranoia. Dalaran's ruler, Ardogon, invited many of these disgruntled magi to his city. There he proclaimed they could live free of prejudice. Many of these magi answered Ardogon's call and settled in Dalaran. When the first group of these sorcerers arrived, they decided to remake the city into a glorious center of knowledge. Using their great powers, the magi expanded Dalaran in size and scope. They raised gleaming spires throughout the city and constructed vast libraries and repositories of arcane wonders. Ardagon and the most powerful of these newly arrived magi formed a magocracy? Magocracy? To govern the burgeoning city. This ruling body encouraged the study and practice of arcane arts. As word of Dalaran spread, magi from across Erethor began to use it, began to see it as a symbol of hope and freedom. Within a few years, Dalaran exploded in population. Though only a small percentage of residents could wield the arcane, the protection they offered allowed trade and industry to grow unimpeded. Crime was virtually non-existent. The dangers of the wild were largely forgotten. But... This unchecked spellcasting had disastrous consequences. The reckless use of magic began tearing through the fabric of reality in the region. Dalaran's magi were unaware that waves of arcane energy billowed out from the city and into the twisting nether. These tides of power drew the attention of scattered demons belonging to the Burning Legion. A small number of these demons slipped into the physical world, infiltrating Dalaran itself. Though these creatures were weak and usually alone, they succeeded in sowing chaos and terrorizing the peaceful city. The majocracy struggled to deal with these demonic intrusions while also keeping them a secret from the public. More and more, the city's rulers feared that if the superstitious populace learned the truth, they would panic and riot. Eventually, the majocracy sought help from beyond the city's walls. The ruling magi sent an urgent request to the high elves of Kel'Thalas. The humans hoped that the elves, in their infinite wisdom, might understand how to deal with the sudden influx of demons. The ruling body in Kel'Thalas, the Council of Silvermoon, immediately dispatched the high elves' greatest magi to investigate. They determined that only a few demons had crossed into the physical world, but the magi knew that this was merely the beginning. The problem would grow worse unless the majocracy placed limits on humans' use of magic. Many of Dalaran's leaders rejected the High Elves' recommendation. Magi had come to the city because they could freely practice their arcane arts. Restricting them would result in a number of detrimental effects. At best, most of the brightest magi would leave and continue their arcane studies elsewhere. At worst, Dalaran's entire economy would collapse, sparking a revolt and scattering the magi to the far corners of the land. One way or another, the use of arcane magic would continue, be it within Dalaran's walls or without. No matter what happened, the threat posed by the Burning Legion would always exist. Having agreed that they could not prohibit the use of magic, the Council of Silvermoon and the Majocracy of Dalaran decided on another solution. Together they formed a clandestine order to deal with the demonic invaders. This new group met within a secret grove in Tirasfall Glades to discuss its work, and it became known as the Council of Tirasfall. 
The Order's gifted members would be responsible for tracking and banishing the Legion's agents wherever they might be found across the land. The Magi would also quietly educate other Magi about the dangers of reckless spellweaving. The First Guardian For decades, the first members of the Council of Tirasfal discreetly tracked down and banished any demons they could find. When facing extraordinarily powerful foes, the Council's members would channel their abilities into a single individual who would act as a solitary vessel of their power for a short time. Empowering a single champion was a dangerous ritual. As such, it was only done in rare and dire circumstances. The council members would have to be in close proximity to perform the ritual, leaving them vulnerable. The massive influx of energies also had the potential to destroy the appointed champions. Yet, if they survived, they could overwhelm even the Burning Legion's mightiest agents. Despite the risks, the Council of Tirasfal used this empowering technique to great effect for many years. But everything changed when a dreadlord named Kathra Netir infiltrated Dalaran. This cunning demon stalked the city's beautiful spires, spreading his poison through the heavens, sorry, through the hearts and minds of the populace. Terrible plagues gripped Dalaran. As the affliction spread, a veil of paranoia enveloped the city. Upon investigating these phenomena, the Council of Tirasfal discovered and confronted Catherine Etir. The gifted magi found themselves outmatched by the demon. Seeing no other recourse, they moved to empower a high elf named Ayrton Brighthand as their champion. Aertin hurled himself against Catherine Etir, wielding the council's combined might as his own. It was here that Catherine Etir turned the council's greatest strength to his own advantage. Rather than face the champion directly, the demon struck out at the Order's members. With their energies and bright hands control, they could not defend themselves. Catherine Etir's showery assault disrupted the connection between the council members and Aertin. This in turn weakened the champion's powers until eventually he fell to the demon. Only the desperate intervention of a young half-elf named Alodi spared the council from total annihilation. The wary council rallied for another battle, but this time as individual magi with no champion to focus their strength. Catherine Atir reveled in the council's disarray, easily thwarting his adversaries. The defeat shattered the Council of Tirasfal's confidence and hope. The Magi knew that they could not overcome Catherine and Tyr as individuals, nor could they rely on their empowerment ritual. In this dark moment, Alodi and his allies discovered a new way to wield their power. No longer would the Council members need to be present for the battle. Through a complex ritual, they could permanently grant someone a portion of their power. Alodi was the first to undergo this experimental technique. When the ritual proved successful, he declared himself not the council's champion, but its guardian. The newly empowered Alodi faced and struck down Catherine Etir, banishing the dreadlord back to the roaring depths of the twisting nether. Hailed as a hero, Alodi would serve as the first guardian of Tirasfall. He used his great powers to prolong his life, and for a hundred years, he hunted down the Legion's minions. At the end of his century of service, Alodi gave up his power voluntarily, choosing to live out the remainder of his days in peace and tranquility. So began the tradition of the Guardian. Every century, a new mage would arise to dedicate his or her life to safeguarding Azeroth. The Magi chosen to wield the Council's might would demonstrate their humility and commitment to peace by giving up their tremendous power after a hundred years. For more than a millennium, an unprecedented era of prosperity reigned across the whole of Azeroth. Though conflict and suffering could not be entirely eradicated, the Guardians ensured that no demonic intruders would harm the world. As these noble individuals waged their lonely secret war against the Legion, Dalaran continued to serve as one of the world's foremost centers of arcane knowledge and research. 
and we're going to take a break there. Thank you for listening. <laughs> 